I guess it won't come as any surprise that after three days of racing, there's an awful lot being discussed down here in Auckland. But one of the hot topics is what can INEOS Team UK do to improve their performance? It's a complicated issue, these are complicated boats after all, and boats for which there is no form guide. But aside from the shape of the hull, which presumably the team can't do an awful lot about at this stage, there are two key aspects to performance, at least as I see it. There's lifting the boat out of the water, and then there's the power plant that provides the power to actually get the boat out of the water in the first place. That's the rig and the sail plan. The foils, well, you can build six sets of foils under the class rules, and we understand that Team Ineos UK have actually built all six of those, so presumably the last set that they use were the fastest, but that's not necessarily the case. But setting that to one side for the moment, what about the sail plan? That's something that we haven't really talked an awful lot about at this stage. But when we look at the Kiwi boat, for instance, they seem to have a very sophisticated mainsail arrangement. So to find out more about how the rigs work and what the options might be for INEOS Team UK in trying to boost the power plant, I went to go and have a chat with North Sales President Kenny Reid. Kenny, here we are. We're in Auckland. It was a bit of a slog getting here, wasn't it? A bit of a workup, but what a special place to be. And we've had four days now, four solid days of, well, three solid days of racing and one day that didn't quite work out. Yeah. What are your, I mean, you've commentated on the whole lot. Now, now that you've had time for sort of the dust to settle and thoughts to crystallize, what's your overall view as to what, you, what we saw? I think there was a real sigh of relief from especially the Italians and the Americans that they aren't in the position. That, it's your biggest fear going to one of these events. You know, somebody said the other day, it might have been you, they said, we showed up in the IACC boats and if you were a tenth of a knot off, you were kind of screwed, but you were only a tenth of a knot off. Here, there, sometimes there's 10 knots off, right? So any team is gonna be very thankful that they're not in that situation that the Brits find themselves in right now. Let's be honest, it's a tough spot. Now, uh, so I think there's a big, big, big sigh of relief from the Americans and the Italians. Second thing is, I think the, Itali uh, the, the Kiwis are happy where they are. I think they expect to be fast. I, I, don't, I think they expect it maybe to be a little faster in, in comparison to the group. But uh, they know they have the right building blocks, and I think they got plenty of powder dry right now, you know, especially trying the two different boards, as we saw later on in the event. And then, um, the Brits, and I, I'm going to go out on a limb right now and say they're going to be competitive by the time we get around to this. I, I think the, the one thing that they didn't talk about much is that I think they knew a while back that they had struggles in different times. And, and one of the things that struck a chord with me is on day two, they had the highest boat speed of the day of yeah. any boat. That means they're set up, they're geared up too high. You know, their foils are geared up for that higher end. And, mm -hmm. and I, I think they're gonna work on their lap time and they're gonna slow down their, their all up speed, which means foil, maybe even foil thickness as much as foil shape and um, slow down and then and make the boat more controllable. You know, it's very clear that they can't they're losing, we, on those, some of those worm graphs, we saw some big dips on almost every tack and jibe. So they're losing so much in tacks and jibe, but then when they get going, they're actually going pretty quick. And then of course, the well-documented getting out of the water part. That's, that's the same thing. That's a more forgiving foil uh, is gonna help you get out of the water, clearly. It's gonna help you maneuvers, clearly. It may not give you that all up fastest speed, but I, I, I these are no dummies in that compound, you know, and, and so I, I think they're going to be a little better than people think coming right out of the block. Yeah. I actually give Ben and company high, high marks for not just losing yeah. their minds during that. But they, see, that again tells me, and I, I, you know, I have my media hat on. I've, I've, joined, I've joined your ranks, which <laughs> scares me to be good with. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> but the media person in me says they absolutely, that's another reason why they knew for them to be so composed during 
well, four days plus the two practice race days, remember? So six days of kind of miserable results. They knew. They knew yeah. and they've been working on this for a while. Yeah. Okay, so that's the overall view. Now, one of the other areas, or one of the key areas that a lot of people are sort of looking at is obviously the sale plans, because we haven't, no one's really looked at those that much. Mm. And it seems like we're starting to see indications of just how different the Kiwi setup is. But maybe maybe start off by telling us why these why these rigs are so different. I mean, we know they're twin skin and we know they're D section at the front. Right. From that point, what makes them special? So the the predicament that a soft sail has is it has to be and and why a hard wing is so good is is the efficiency of its ability to add power to get the boat up and out and going and then almost immediately reduce power to become a high speed section. So you have to go from camber to camber. It, it, you know, that's obviously yeah. an exaggeration, but it's not far from an exaggeration. That's, that's the depth changes that have to be made. I think the teams, and Emirates Team New Zealand, historically now, this is their third um, foiling campaign. So I can talk about it now, but I went sailing with them in San Francisco. They, they were starting to really, really, and they, and they started breaking, they started breaking the, the ribs inside the, the, the wing because they were just adjusting it completely different. They were, they were tweaking it down low. They were really adjusting the back end down low and really almost inverting the, the top of the, of the mm. wing. They, they went crazy on that. And that's when they learned how to fly upwind. You know, that's, that's when they got really? flying. And, and so in, uh, clearly in Bermuda, they had by far the most control, integrated controllable system of anybody, whether it's traveler up down, whether it's whether a puff hits, the traveler goes, the lower leech opens, the twist happens, the camber goes away, and, and they've done it again here. I mean, mm. there's no question that it, you, we've had a few drone shots. There's no question. As soon as the boat gets up and going, the whole thing just changes shape. And I, but this time, I think there's also there's the jib leads in and out. There's the jib camber. There's the head stay tension. There's the running back stays. So without so it's a, it's the whole package in that depth of in that power to get out and as soon as the boat starts to accelerate it literally has to go vroom like that immediately and i i think the teams who have taken that as seriously as the stuff underwater are ahead right now you know and and i think all the teams will especially with our onboard videos of some of these systems, you know, the, the Kiwi back in, in the clue of their main, there was pistons up and down, there were pistons in and out, there were pistons, there were... Are there a lot more rams? Because we can see at least one really clearly. Uh, the there, I saw at least three. Really? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That presumably they're all low down, they're not halfway up the sail. Well, there is, so I, I am absolutely winging it here, right? So again, I've, I've joined the media, so I'm just <laughs> absolutely making stuff up as I go. But uh, the, I think all the controlling parts of it are down low for the most part. And then there's lines, control right. or systems that go up. Now, whether it's controlling the head of the main that goes like this or whether they're controlling individual battens. Um, you know, remember, those battens are like their own mass. So you, you can open, shut, force camber in, get rid of camber immediately. And how that all works in between the two skins uh, we're, n we're not going to know until this is over, but I mm -hmm. guarantee you that uh, it is a major topic. And, and they keep talking. I think some of the teams, again, speculating, dismissed it because it is a weight problem. You know, you're adding control systems and everything else up high. You're allowed to control the top four meters of the sail and the bottom two meters structurally, you know, like, like this. Um, so I, I think that it is adding weight. So I think some teams might have said, sorry, that's too weight prohibitive. Let's, mm -hmm. let's do it as simply as mm -hmm. possible. But then you, you, might, you might be seeing, for all we know, that it was the sails more than the wings on the British boat, for all we know. So down at the bottom end of the Kiwi mainsail, we see a lot of control lines out the bottom. Yeah. That's presumably part of that whole control so I think that part is just like an automatic um, re uh, retriever uh, uh, easer 
that happens to control that foot and the end plate effect on the deck. You see some of the end plates on a couple of the boats, the American Magic is struggling to get around that boom yeah. and then actually end plate it off on the deck. I think the Kiwi is not having a, a boom structure. I think a sign is, is how much the travelers go up and down. Yeah. And the more a traveler moves, probably the less control you have of the rest of the sail because you're really having to dump the traveler on a bear off or, or wh whatever the case may be. And we saw, we saw during one of the races, the Americans were banging the, uh, you yeah. know, uh, Paul Goodison, the, the, the traveler car was banging into the bottom of the boat like, God, I wish that this was another 10 feet longer. You never see that movement on the Kiwis. So I, I, their, mm. their, their ultimate control of the mainsail, that to me is a telltale sign that, that they have more control at this stage. Yeah. Don't think for a second the rest of the teams aren't adding contraptions <laughs> as we speak. You touched on it earlier on about how syndicates had maybe, maybe thought about how they're going to develop their rigs some way out. And I remember hearing when, when I was asking people who were involved in the design just generally about it. And one of the things I was hearing back was it was all about the foils. It was all about the foils on the end of the canting arm and those kind of things. And when, you asked, when I asked about the rigs, it's like, well, yeah, the rigs are the rigs. It was almost like they'd been sort of, well, we can't do much about that. And we'd much rather have a solid wing. And it These boats are significantly higher and faster upwind than the solid wings are. So... They're not slow. Is that because is that because you can make the section asymmetric though, like yes. a proper wing, so you can uh, have it curved on one again, side, flat I, on the other? I specifically heard Ben talk about, you know, what do you think about this twin skin mainsail? And he said, ah, you know, I, I think it did it all over again. A single skin would have been fine, and we just, I, I took that as, oof, I know other teams for sure would have said, wow, is this real? So, again, pure mm -hmm. speculation. Maybe it was just a internal dismissal. Mm -hmm. Seems strange. Grant Simmer is an ex, you know, he worked for North Sales for a long time, ex sail maker. So uh, he, he, he's no dummy when it comes to sales, mm -hmm. and none of them are. But maybe it was just you have to put emphasis somewhere, yeah. and uh, sometimes you lose sight of, of possibilities. So, on that front, what do you think that they can do? I appreciate you're not in the in the team, but what, what do you think they can? Can they do anything? Can Ineos do anything on that score? To yeah, the, so they can create systems. Again, the systems are all hidden inside the sails, inside the mast. So they, they, they get, they're going to have to give up a little bit of weight for adding systems to be more controlling. And, and by that, I mean deeper to pop the boat out and then instantly flatter and... and how much of that can be automated? Like I, I heard, a, I heard an interview with uh, Andrew Campbell the other, the other day, and he's talking about the flight controllers, and he's on like generation eight or something of his flight controllers. So you're not going to just snap your fingers mm -hmm. overnight and ha and 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 have a control box like or some sort of computerized system like apparently some of the other teams do that, that's going to work overnight, you know? So I think their dilemma in England right now is not, the, is not having good ideas, it's having enough time to implement mm. them all. We know that they've used all six of their foil allocations and they could, we presume, change up to 20%, but I'm not quite sure whether A, that's a 20% problem and B, what 20% really means in real terms, what you can actually achieve. but. Is it more realistic, therefore, to then to look, are there bigger gains to be made in developing their sale plan, do you think, or is it easier? Uh, th that's a good question, and um, I think we're gonna know in three weeks pretty quick. You know, we're gonna see what, which foils they have on the boat. So did they go back to one of their older sets, which they've been working on for weeks, maybe, already, and, and changing. Remember, I think it's 20% is a weight and area or something like that because weight weight f comes into that that foil part too in the center of gravity mm -hmm. and everything else so just going and saying hey guys you know like you know the fairing on your on your j24 keel or something hey let's just go get it fared and fill in the hollows or let's just build up the leading edge within the rules a little bit and make it a little more forgiving don't think it's that simple when you're no. going 50 knots through the water. You know, it, 
it'll be fascinating to see what, what set of foils they got, and that'll t go a long way to tell us uh, what they've had up their sleeve and trying to make those better, more forgiving, better maneuvers, whatever the case may be. Just finally, as a sailmaker, and going back to talking about the rigs and the sail plans, how much of this do you think will find its way into the mainstream at some point? How much of the knowledge technology will actually transfer later on? It's always far more than we think. Um, so it's very easy to say, this is crazy, this is space age, this is so far out there. Well, two years ago, nobody said monohulls can fly and go and you know have upwind VMGs of 36 knots or something. I, so, so it's always more than you think. And the first thing that comes to mind is, is like these offshore monohulls and multi-hulls that are so, they're so short-handed, they're really, really difficult to uh, reef and unreef. So imagine if you had control s um, systems where you could make it way deeper in the light and instantly flatter as the breeze comes on, like these systems apparently are able to do, then you're then you can have a smaller sail plan, first of all, and you wouldn't have to reef quite as much. So you're ripping through the doldrums and every three hours you got a 25, 30 knot, uh, you know, 30 knot uh, squall that comes through. Um, you just, you know, twist, blah, 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 flat, boom, boom, boom. Thank you very much. Go back to having your cup of tea. So that's just one example, but uh, I think we already announced the other day, Mark Mills uh, announced with a very good Italian client of ours uh, that they're doing a mini maxi offshore foiling sailboat to race. Mm -hmm. Here we go. <laughs> here we go. That's all I can say. As soon as I saw it, I was like, wow, here we go. Yeah. Because it's always far more than you think. You mentioned early on, right at the beginning, you said that you think that the Brits are going to be competitive. Any reason why you think that they're going to be competitive, or you just oh, get that sense? No, no, no. I, I, I think if there was real pressure being turned up, you would have seen a breaking point. And so I, I think they realize they have some um, tricks up their sleeve. And I'm guessing they're all hugely disappointed that they're this far behind at this stage. But I think they still realize they have a long way to go. But they are not as down as mm -hmm. I personally would be if I were in that situation. So I think they know something we don't, let's put it that way. Now, I hope that was of interest. I certainly found it fascinating talking to Kenny about the rigs and the developments that are going on. That interview was actually filmed just before Christmas and a lot has happened since then. And first of all, I have to apologize for the fact that I've got no microphone on me. I'm using the alternative phone that hasn't got the great camera in it because I was actually out on my morning run. Don't laugh, I really was. And as I came down to uh, the viaduct, Ineos were launching their boat and it's currently the 3rd of January and I noticed that their rig is very different. On top of that, I'm starting to hear a few little gossips and whispers that in fact the entire sail plan is new. So there's plenty been going on. So with my uh, cheapo phone, I tried to record what I could as they're launching the boat and sticking it in the water, ready to go testing. It's gonna be fascinating to see what they've done. So here's a little post postscript. There we go. Shortly after I got back, the thunder and lightning started. Just after the Brits have put up their brand new stick. Just down there testing times.